Welcome to Piano Inspires podcast, celebrating pianists, teachers, and innovators as they share their inspiring stories about the transformative power of music. Hello, I'm Andrea McAllister, and I'm here with Dr. Artina McCain, who is hailed by the New York Times as a virtuoso pianist. Um, she's built a formidable career as a performer, educator, and speaker, um, and she is currently teaching at the University of Memphis. Welcome, Artina. Hi, Andy. <laughs> Let's start with young Artina. Okay. Let's take it back right. to your childhood. <laughs> Where did you get this love of music? How did you come to music as a child? Was it something that your family, you know, was really valued in your family? Where did you start? Well, I like to tell the story that my mom didn't like my singing, so they put me in piano lessons. <laughs> I wish it was, okay. you know, some divine moment, but it was like, child, you cannot sing, so you will play an instrument where we don't have to hear you. Um, my grandmother actually played the piano, so I did sort of see a piano in their home, in my grandparents' home, but I mean, she wasn't a professional pianist. She took taught a few music lessons, played in church, and that was it. So I remember when I was eight years old, we played a forehand piece, which was really cool for me and my grandmother. But yeah, my family just, I mean, they enjoy music, but they're not musicians. And they're kind of like, oh, you're a pianist? That's cool. That's interesting. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't come from a family of musicians. Do, did you have siblings? Were they involved with music? Or are you the one that really took to it. I'm definitely the one that took to it. I have two younger brothers and they both played in the band, trombone and tuba. But no, mm -hmm. it was more sort of like children need activities to my parents instead of like mm -hmm. children need to become concert pianists and symphony musicians. So you could have made a little trio of, oh. of <laughs> gone out touring with the siblings. Right. And yes. <laughs> So, so you, you know, after taking lessons, who was your first teacher? Yeah, so my very, very first teacher, I started actually when I was six years old for one year, and I took with a neighborhood pianist, and at six years old, I don't remember who she was, because my, my mom just sort of walked me down the street and was like, you're going to take piano here. And I always tell my friends now, you know, being so young, just one day the lesson stopped. I didn't even take that long. I'm like, I think my teacher passed away. I think my mom just didn't tell me. Oh. So I had sort of a brief one year at six years old, and then we stopped piano lessons for several years, and then I restarted at age nine. So really from the beginning again. So okay. yeah, yeah, I had a teacher in, in Texas, in Grand Prairie, Texas, and mm -hmm. yeah, she was so nurturing, and I just loved my time with her. That, but I guess I should have asked that first. Where was, did you grow up in Texas? I did. So I grew up out in the Dallas area. So for people that are from Dallas, they might know Grand Prairie. It used to be a little small town, but now it's like a big suburb. And then we lived in Arlington, Texas. So I am a Texan girl at heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you started with this teacher when you were nine then. And was that really where, were you asking for lessons? Were you saying, you know, I really want to come back to this? Or was it just, you need activities? Like, <laughs> and so off you go, you can't sing, so. Definitely you, you need activities. Gotta go back. It's like this child has too much energy. So yeah, it, it was you need activities, but I did really enjoy playing the piano. And so I would say probably about age 14, that's when I was really like, oh, I really like piano. I really want to play and do this. And we moved to Florida at that time too. So my parents actually made me research piano teachers and find my own piano teacher. Wow. Mm -hmm. So how did you, what year was this? Ooh, we're not oh, we're not giving Oh, years. I should, that's oh, true. <laughs> I will not ask that. Was it before or after Google was a big thing? Before no, we'll just, Google. <laughs> we'll just. For the internet. Yes. How and, did you find her? Well, or him? You, Who you, was your teacher? You know, back in the day, we used to have those music teachers association manuals and it lists all of oh. the teachers. So I think my dad knew somebody in the Orlando area and he was like, oh, you know, how can we get started with this? And they made me go through the manual and call everybody. And I did. That, can you imagine? No. <laughs> Getting a call from a 14 year old? <laughs> well, as a mother of a 14-year-old, mm -hmm. I can honestly say that is unimaginable to me <laughs> that she would, my own daughter would would 
be willing to make phone calls. But I think 14-year-olds in general are different right, these days. That's true. Maybe texting, <laughs> but never a phone call. Right, right, right. So that took a lot of initiative. It did, well, for it was forced, but yes. <laughs> well, but you did you call anyone and say, oh, that's not the teacher for me? Or did you just say the first person who said yes? You well, said. I think my dad had at least narrowed it down to who his friend recommended. So I called those teachers and I, I wrote notes about what they said. And then we did a pros and cons list. And that's how we decided. Very sophisticated teenage stuff. Well, that explains a lot about <laughs> who you are today, I think, <laughs> that you made that whole list. You had your list of pros and cons, mm-hmm. very organized. Mm-hmm. So who who ended up being the teacher? Yeah, so I ended up taking with the teacher who at the time was teaching at the University of Central Florida. She was Canadian. Her name was Helen Hardy. And I think I really bloomed with her. She had, I re- will never forget, because she had a piano studio, like one that was built onto her house. Mm. So I was like, oh, wow, this is a dream, you know? <laughs> like a whole studio just of pianos. I remember she had two pianos, a harpsichord, um, a forte piano. It was just like wild to me. So yeah, she was very nurturing and encouraging and sort of put me in all the events and kind of, you know, my first experience at music teacher events. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. that's where I think I really took off. Well, it's... Fortunate that you found her in the list. Yeah. And do you still have those the book. notes? Do you have the notes? No, on I stuff? don't. Oh. That would have been cool to see. Yeah. See what your initial thoughts were mm-hmm. of, of the, your teacher. Um, do you remember any, um, you know, any teaching gems that she might have given you, or just you know, uh, ways in which she motivated you or or nurtured you that really stuck with you? Yeah, there is one thing that sticks out to me that I still do for my students today because I always think, oh, my high school teacher did this for me and I want to pass this along. So when I graduated from high school, she gave me a huge amount of books, a collection of Beethoven sonatas, Haydn Mm -hmm. sonatas, Mozart sonatas, like romantic works, you know, at the time, 20th century (laughs) works. (laughs) And I always thought that was so nice because... You know, especially you're trying to build your repertoire and your collection. I mean, she must have given me like 30 books to go off to college with. So Mm -hmm. that's always stuck with me. And I don't give my students 30 books, sorry. But I might give them like one or two. (laughs) They just encourage them in their study and, you know, whatever their interests are. Oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, Yeah, it was. And how did that, how, as you were in high school, you know, because those would be your high school years, Um, Did you do a lot with music in your school or Mm -hmm. how did that integrate with your other studies in high school and then, you know, moving on into college? Yeah, sure. So I actually went to a performing arts magnet school in Orlando, Florida. So not only did I have a great independent teacher, but I also had a great community when I went to high school because we were always doing productions and I would play with musical theater I played with the choir. I mean, as soon as they found out I played piano, I basically played with everybody. (laughs) So I had a really intense collaborative study, you know, little known to me from age 14 to 18, just from playing with all the ensembles at my high school. And what great experience. Mm -hmm. I I can always tell those students who get to college and they have this this wonderful set of skills that they didn't even know they were developing. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you had just such a varied experience in high school that you're able to do this. Yeah, it's, I think it's becoming increasingly rare that a pianist would be plugged in like that in high school. So it was a very magical place. I will tell you, I'll date myself with this. <laughs> One of my classmates was a backup singer for Britney Spears when she was touring. So <laughs> this is the kind of high school I went to. <laughs> wow. Yeah. But you were not the backup singer I because was... you were... Obviously not. Yeah. To the piano lane pretty <laughs> early. And then so you you move out of that that environment, that high school, and you go on to college. And did you immediately know, yes, this is what this is my career? Yeah, I knew at 14. <laughs> That's what yeah. I wanted to do. But when I had the list, right? I had to call the piano teachers. Yeah. So yeah, high school was just sort of an extension of that, you know, continuing to get really great study. I studied with Carol Leone, who's very familiar to the NZKP community. So yeah, it was really awesome. And where did you go for your undergraduate? Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Back home for me. Back home. Mm -hmm. And so you came into your undergraduate degree. Um, Did you know all the work that was 
<laughs> that was in store. And, and, you know, just not just the work of being in college, but just the, the work that was going to, it was going to take to build a career mm. out of, you know, being a pianist. No, definitely skills. not. <laughs> I think you, I think we sort of have this idealized view of what that looks like. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, pre-Google, <laughs> we couldn't just type it in and be like, how did it become <laughs> a concert pianist? So no, I definitely didn't have sort of a clear route Increasingly, as I was going through my academic education as college, Google did show up. So yes. it started to get easier, but mm -hmm. no, not at first. Yes. Well, it's a it's an interesting path. And you've had a very interesting path moving through your degrees. Mm -hmm. um, where did you go after SMU? I went to Cleveland Institute of Music and then eventually to University of Texas at Austin. It was too cold in Cleveland, so. Yes, I, know. <laughs> I know, we will get you back sometime. Uh, now, I know along the way that you've been, you've had to deal with some injuries. Mm -hmm. And so can you talk a little bit about that and how you've overcome that? Sure. So I guess probably during my undergrad studies, I felt, you know, probably your normal bouts of pain from over practicing and kind of doing the most. Uh, but I really experienced a performance injury when I was at Cleveland Institute of Music, conservatory student, practicing six to eight hours a day, probably doing way more than my body could handle. But when you're very young, I think you don't have a perception of sort of what's too much. And people, especially then, were sort of thinking no pain, no gain. So, you know, you have to practice more, you know, put the mm -hmm. coat over the window so nobody can bother you. And so I kind of bought into that mentality, you know, fortunately, unfortunately. And so that was the initial injury and, and um, journey to recovery. So how did you, at what point did you realize that, oh, that's not just a little pain that mm. will, you know, I'll, I'll work through it. Um, as many pianists think when mm -hmm. they feel a little twinge and they're like, oh, it's just, uh, it'll get better. I'll just, I have to keep practicing. At what mm. point did you realize, oh no, this is something more serious than that? Yeah, I wish I had figured it out earlier, but I, I was at the end of my master's degree when I realized that I had to at least stop and go find some help. At the time, Cleveland Clinic had a performing arts institute, which I don't know if they still do or not, but... I think they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. they did. And they had doctors sort of dedicated to musicians. So I went there. That was my initial stopping point. And I got kind of the run of the mill response to what you should do. You know, take ibuprofen. You should rest you do some physical therapy. So I did all of that and mm -hmm. I eventually finished the degree. But when I finished the degree, I was in more pain than I was when I started <laughs> to try to finish the degree. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I took off about three years seeking alternative solutions. And what were those alternative solutions? So many. I mean, I did many things that the community is probably familiar with, like yoga, massage therapy, Alexander technique, massotherapy, among other things, Taubman. And, you know, I, I received benefits from doing those things, and I regained some of my stamina uh, before I would go to pursue my doctorate degree. And so I kind of had gotten back up to a sufficient amount of practice time, but nothing like what a concert artist would do. It was sort of just enough to maintain my educational career. So during those three years, were you were you still in Cleveland doing the rehabilitation? Oh thing? yeah, that's a good question. I'm like, where was I? <laughs> um, part of the time I was in Cleveland, and then because it was too cold, and I think actually my body, you know, the stress of the injury and not being able to play or perform. I decided to move back to Texas actually before I started my doctorate degree. So yeah, part of it was in Cleveland and I got a lot of help there. I had an Alexander teacher there, but I just felt like it was time to move home. So that's what mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. So you taking, you know, baby steps, getting back into practicing. Mm -hmm. um, was there ever a point where you thought, this is just not going to work? It took three years and that's, quite a bit of time for a pianist to, yeah. take, to take off. You know, I know it wasn't really taking time off, but. Right. Yeah, no, it, it turned out to be six years total, but I, I took the three years and the three years was enough for me to start to apply for doctorate programs. I just wanted to get in. You know, I just was sort of maintaining enough practice to get into the program. So I got into the program. I studied with Anton Nell there. And, you know, for people who've done doctorate degrees, it's a lot of, academic work that first year so I wasn't playing a lot anyway 
which was perfect <laughs> as I tried to find myself and regain my strength. Uh, but after that first year, I decided that I wanted to, you know, try my hand at performing again, see if I could get back on the stage. And so I did that by playing at my church because I thought church music would be easy. <laughs> uh, Sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was a band and I thought, you know, the piano is not really the main instrument here. Other the guitar will cover me or something like that. But I hadn't really been practicing consecutive time. I was doing like 20 minutes here, three hours later, 20 minutes here, <laughs> things like that. And so when I got to play with church in a rehearsal, you know, and the rehearsal was like 90 minutes, I just couldn't do it. So I, it was more and more pain. And then after I played on Sunday, I actually lost mobility in my hand going from like a 10th to a 7th. And that was the moment, as you asked, back to your question, <laughs> that was the moment that I was like, I think I'm going to quit because I've lost mobility in my hand. I just can't seem to sort of get over the pain. You know, I would get a little bit better, not well enough to do any sort of concertizing or performing, not even well enough to demonstrate for my students. I was teaching probably 40 students or so back in those days. I couldn't even do the little duets, you know, <laughs> in the bottom because it was just too painful for me. So most of my teaching was very verbal in those mm -hmm. days and not demonstrative. So mm -hmm. that was my point where I was like, I think piano's done for me after my first year of my DMA. And so what changed? Yeah, so what changed was <laughs> the last alternative technique I tried was the one for me. So uh, there is a practice in Austin, Texas called the Continuum Method. And there's a neuromuscular specialist there. And I learned about it literally right after I had this injury playing church music. One of the women from the church was an amateur pianist. And she told me that she had gone there. She had the same struggles as me. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I don't think you have, but <laughs> I'm at least listening. So yeah, I just didn't want to quit. And so I tried out, you know, uh, kind of a Hail Mary to go mm -hmm. to this practice and it really revolutionized my life. I I had actually racked up several injuries during my 20s. I was in multiple car accidents. Ooh. I had um, patellofemoral syndrome in my knees, runner's knee. I They actually put me in orthotics, <laughs> you know, like an old person. I, I actually had um, not the ones like the Dr. Scholl's, you know, that you just sort of yes. slip in. Yes. I had the ones that they make you put your foot in clay and custom they, yeah, a custom wow. orthotic at 27. <laughs> so I was, you know, very handicapped. I mean, I couldn't stand more than 15 minutes. I, so it wasn't just piano that was going downhill. It was really my whole physical health. So, so this practice not only revitalized and resurrected my performance career, but it also just gave me a better quality of life. That's amazing. So was it, um, like physical therapy or what exactly do they do yeah. to make you standing for longer right. than 15 minutes? What is this uh, magic? Right. <laughs> Some oil. <laughs> no, it's a manual technique where they test muscular imbalances and weaknesses. And so once they identify that, of course, I'm, you know, paraphrasing paraphrasing this, once they identify the muscular weaknesses, they go to the root of the problem. And after they identify, you know, however many Muscles that you have that are not working, they believe it's cumulative, obviously. Obviously, in my case, if I can't stand up, it's cumulative. Um, then they just work to turn those muscles back on, kind of like a car battery. They believe mm. that it's either functioning or not functioning, and they turn them back on manually. And the more muscles you have working in your body, the better you feel. So, you know, when I got there, not too much was working. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, it was, wow. it was really revolutionary for me. And, and, I mean, my whole life, really, not just um, piano. And are you can, is this something that you did at the beginning of your DMA and they fixed you your heels? Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. And mm -hmm. now you're, you, you never have to go back. Or is this something that you continue to do to this day? I do continue to do it to this day. When I first went, because I was in such bad shape, I was going every week. I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes even multiple times a week. So like, you're so young and you're so handicapped, you know, for no for at least from doctor's perspective, no reason I didn't have like a disease or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I was going multiple times a week. Now I might go four times a year. So it's just maintenance for me because mm -hmm. I want to continue to get stronger and make sure that I'm tip top shape. Well, 
from everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine you doing all of those things if you were not in tip top shape. Right. um, (laughs) You're right. (laughs) I I feel like every time I turn around, or or Tina McCain is doing something (laughs) else and you're you're putting out a book or you're uh, hosting the Van Cliburn competition (laughs) or performing in, you know, in New York City. Mm -hmm. Um, So, uh, Clearly, whatever they did Mm -hmm. has been working. Absolutely. Um, But let's talk about all these projects you have going on. Because, oh my goodness, it's you're like a whirlwind of activity. (laughs) Right. Um, Let's talk, well, you, as we mentioned, you currently teach at the University of Memphis. Yes. And um, so you have a number of students there. How are you using the information that you have gained from all of your experiences with your physical health? Um, I'm... I can't imagine that hasn't greatly informed your Mm. teaching. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Well, like I mentioned earlier, I wish I was paying attention when I was young. I wish that the academic community encouraged that instead Mm -hmm. of encourage sort of more is more, (laughs) you know, sometimes less is more. Mm -hmm. And so that's definitely something now that I'm aware of that not everyone's body can handle six to eight hours. Some people's bodies can, you know, if I was a football player, I could be tackled. Artina cannot be tackled, you know. <laughs> Artina will be in the hospital if somebody tackles her. <laughs> but those are things we don't think about as pianists. We don't mm-hmm. think, well, look at this pianist build. Of course they can go out and do six to eight hours. This build cannot. And mm-hmm. not that you cannot, but you might have to, you know, work out, body build, you know, mm-hmm. lift weights in order to have that same kind of stamina. So that's sort of the first thing that I was immediately aware of is our bodies are not all the same. <laughs> And we should not expect them to all function at the same amount of time. And then mental practice became huge for me, especially when I could only play like one hour a day. I mean, the only way I can audition for a doctorate program is to score study. So Mm -hmm. I practice a lot less, (laughs) but a lot smarter than I did when I was younger and a lot more focused. And that's something that I teach my students to do. So they don't feel like they have to be in a practice room all the time to be efficient. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's so interesting when we, we really get, dig into like what made Artina McCain Artina McCain, oh. right? But Struggle. The, <laughs> the, the lessons that you've had to learn over the many years and mm-hmm. recovering from these injuries, you know, your students are going to be so mm-hmm. much better informed mm-hmm. because you've had those experiences and mm-hmm. now are passing them along and and you know, so it's wonderful for them. Yeah. And you know, as you go out and, and give all these presentations mm-hmm. and meet with other people and are able to pass that along to others, that's you know, it's strengthening all of our mm-hmm. pedagogical skills, knowing that, oh, you you've had this journey and let's learn from this. Mm-hmm. So um you know, I thank you for going oh. through all of this. <laughs> yeah, that sounds well, I wouldn't recommend it, but. <laughs> but uh, okay, so, and you're still performing a lot. Uh-huh. You, um, it seems you're all over the world mm-hmm. performing. Um, where, where have you been recently? What's coming up? Whoa, what's coming up? Well, probably past this podcast going out, I'll have played at Lincoln Center, which is another check off of my box. I'm so excited about this engagement. Um, It's actually for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I think something that's maybe unique about my career is that I've had the opportunity to go outside of the musical sphere, you know, outside of sort of our Mm -hmm. traditional, like, this is a concert series for serious musicians, you know, (laughs) and really connect with other communities that Mm -hmm. enjoy music and that it's relevant to their own missions. So that has been so meaningful to me is, you know, to be able to do something like this um, for such a world renowned, you know, organization Mm -hmm. that's not, you know, directly affiliated with music, but appreciates what it's going to bring to their conference. So that's the big one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I will look for tickets. To yeah. <laughs> uh, and you often play with your husband mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So that's wonderful. You have a building musician in the yes. household mm-hmm. that you get to collaborate with. Um, so are you performing a- Coming up, have you been performing with him recently? Yeah, we released an album called Renew. So you can go check that out, Spotify, or you can buy it even better <laughs> from our Absolutely. website. Uh, but yeah, we do a lot of university residencies and we like to talk a lot about arts, entrepreneurship, and career mm-hmm. building. So that's sort of been our brand for such a long time. And uh, we have a series on YouTube called the Elevate Series. 
So anybody want to check out some of those old episodes, you can. But yeah, we're really passionate about helping others build their career because my husband's career is actually interesting as well. So the two of our perspectives are are great. You know, we've got the whole orchestra side and the piano chamber side. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's we'll have to do hour two of the podcast. So oh, we can get him in <laughs> here McCain too. duo. <laughs> well, and it is it's such an interesting time to be a musician mm-hmm. and you know, navigate this world and and having your perspective of what students are going to face mm-hmm. once they receive that terminal terminal degree and mm-hmm. go out and go. Now what? Right. I, I have a lot of debt, but I do not have a lot of, of <laughs> job opportunities. Yeah. So um, the fact that you're able to really help this next generation mm-hmm. figure it out mm-hmm. and and know what the opportunities are. Um, are there any like any pieces of advice that you give that mm. you could like little gems that you can pick out and say, well, this is something that I like to pass on Mm -hmm. i would say perseverance if you really feel called to music because i do think it's a calling it's not an easy path i think it's really something you need to love and feel like this is what i'm supposed to do so if that's you then i think you should persevere and let your voice be heard realize that you might be someone who creates paths for others you know we all have unique things that we can bring and i think it's really valuable that we're not all trying to fit in this box of what a pianist looks like because there's not many opportunities for that box, you know? <laughs> Only nice. very few people fit into that box and way fewer than the amount of degrees that are going out. So I think perseverance would be my biggest advice. Yes, well, and I loved what you said about, you know, we're talking about this little box mm-hmm. that that all hundreds of graduates are supposed right. to fit into. <laughs> right. Um, there we do need to create more space and Mm -hmm. i love what you were saying about working with other organizations Mm -hmm. where they're not necessarily musical organizations but they're philanthropic Mm -hmm. and they understand the importance of music and and diverse Mm -hmm. voices in music and diverse um uh styles and i can you tell talk a little bit about your experiences with just Mm. you know kind of breaking the mold of what it means to be this classical pianist, which is a very small box. It's a tiny box. (laughs) Well, I think it's us that created this small box and we're trying to fit everybody into it and it's not productive. So um, I think a very interesting experience I had was, you know, some of our community, whether you listen to their music or not, probably know who Beyonce is. <laughs> and so I had an opportunity to work with her sister on an engagement also in New York City at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, which actually produces all types of genre, opera, classical music, chamber music. And, you know, we think of them as pop stars, right? And I mean, I thought so. When I got the calls, like, why do they want me? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't fit into their box, right? <laughs> I'm in this box and they want me to come to this box. So being one willing to jump boxes has been really great. But also it enriches me as a musician. So, I mean, she had curated where there was a classical portion, there was jazz, there was gospel all on one stage. And that's not usually what we do. We're like, well, if you're classical, you can only do (laughs) these 10 composers (laughs) and you can only play at these stages, you know? So Mm -hmm. just the fact that, you know, this event was forward thinking enough to want to mix genres and that was okay. Um, you also benefit from the audience that you get to interact with. So no, it wasn't the quiet, turn your cell phones off audience. It was the, oh my gosh, video on, flashing lights, screaming. But I'm really energized by that. <laughs> I thought that was cool that, you know, I play a cadence and everybody yells. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not even done yet. <laughs> so, I mean, we keep ourselves from those experiences, right? Because the box is so tiny. And some of us, you know, I didn't actually grow up with these kind of um, experiences with audiences. Actually, the African and American community is very verbal and like, yeah, I mean, while you're playing. (laughs) So quiet audiences actually feel weird to me. Um, So, you know, just being able, I mean, of course I appreciate it based on what we do, but I also like the idea that those people are not coming to our box concerts Mm -hmm. and maybe vice versa, but, they still appreciate it when it's brought to them in a way they understand. Right. And no, it is okay. You can clap between the right. movements. And... <laughs> or even during. Or during. <laughs> yeah. That might be okay, too. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, one thing I, I, 
I love so much, and I ran out and got a copy as soon as it was available, mm-hmm. is your publication with um, the 24 mm-hmm. African American folk tunes. Um, just beautiful music. Oh, thank you. And yeah, you know, I think giving this gift to young students is, I, it's tremendous. Mm-hmm. I just, I love the whole collection. I, you know, give them out to my students. And they're all excited to play them. And so what is that uh, first, what does it mean to you to be able mm-hmm. to create that for students? Um, and how did you come across this project to begin with? Oh, well, interestingly enough, I'm glad you asked that because nobody's ever asked me that. Way back in the day when Piano Magazine was Clavier Companion, <laughs> I was doing some editor- um, some reviews for some of the books that would come out for Hal Leonard, like, mm-hmm. like at the beginning of my career. I actually ran into a woman who was working on the editorial staff at the time. She said, hey, you want to do some reviews? I'm like, sure. That had to be at least a seven to eight year difference between the time that Hal Leonard approached me. So basically they had seen my review all those years ago and she calls me and says, you know, you wrote a a really great review for us like eight years ago. (laughs) You want to write a book? (laughs) What? (laughs) That's exactly how it happened. So you never know who's watching your work. You never know. And that's where perseverance also Mm -hmm. pays because you never know. Mm -hmm. It's going to come around. Right. So, you know, they, in the meantime, have created this fantastic folk song series of books that represent people from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, we Mm want to do, you know, the African-American version of this. Do you want to do it? No. (laughs) Like, I never wrote a book in my life. Are you sure that you are calling the right person <laughs> so they convinced me and i'm so glad that i did because you know those resources weren't available for me when i was a kid you know maybe i could have been a singer if my mom mm. could have found some books <laughs> to encourage me so no it means the world and i'm again i'm glad that i kind of stepped out on faith to do it because it wasn't something that i'd even dreamed that i would do or that I dream would come out of doing a book review, you know, like eight years prior. Right. Mm-hmm. You just never know you who's don't. watching and reading mm-hmm. and appreciating the work that mm-hmm. you're doing. Absolutely. And I think through this book, you have created so many people who are mm. appreciative that you've you've done the work that you didn't say no. Right. Even though you did say no initially. <laughs> right. But that they convinced you that you really should do this. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, just being able to uh, experience things other than Clementi. Right. And I mean, I know yeah. those are all important foundational, mm-hmm. you know, le- you learn a lot of foundational skills through mm-hmm. the standard repertoire, but I, this is such important music to pass along to the kids who are growing up now and getting excited about playing the piano. And right. these pieces are so exciting to play. Yeah. So. And familiar, hopefully, to many, too. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So um, I know we're going to run out of time. So oh. I'm going to ask you three questions to oh, end. Okay. Um, so what is your, what do you feel is your greatest, we'll start with challenge first. We'll start with that one first. Ooh, Andy. <laughs> as a pianist or teacher? Or what? As, a, as a human being. As a human being. Yes. Well, I think life's always giving us new challenges. So um, I think just being focused on whatever it is I'm supposed to do on that day and that moment and the people that are right in front of me. So that's mm-hmm. something I need to do through self-care. I think taking time for myself so I feel energized enough to be able to be there for the people I'm supposed to be there for. Yes. Do you feel like... There are a, a lot of, because you are, you do have so many facets mm. of what you do that it's hard right now to say no and actually mean no mm-hmm. and not have them say, oh, but no, you're going to do this. Right. I, do you find that you know, there are just so many opportunities and you want to, uh, to accept the, mm. and then you end up doing far too much because you're 
just so good at everything. Oh, too. no. <laughs> I don't know if I'm good at everything. I think I've learned that lesson, maybe the hard way of having too much and realizing, mm-hmm. you know, let's just pick the things that, again, I think as I started, the things I'm actually really called to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, because there's probably many things that we can manage doing, but maybe are not the ones that are most life-giving to us or to others. So I think, you know, as you age, you're like, you know, these are the things I'm really good at. I'm good at this. I'm okay at this. I'm not great at this. So I'm trying to get rid of the bottom half. Yeah. Do you think your experiences going through your the injury and the recovery have taught you a did you learn from that that I can't do everything and mm. I really need to just prioritize the top was yeah. I wish no. <laughs> I did not. I think when I got over the injury, I had spent so much time down. It was a very depressing period of six years. that I was like, I want to do everything. Because I kind of make up for lost time, you know. That was the majority of my 20s. That was the time, you know, people were like, oh, this is the best time of your life. Well, it wasn't. <laughs> you know, it wasn't not the best time of my life. <laughs> and so I, I definitely think I was trying to make up for lost time. And even mentally in the back of my head, I kind of feel like that sometime. Like, well, I didn't get that decade, so I got to get it back now. <laughs> um, but it's not healthy. So, yeah, I, I'm getting better at saying no to things and realizing that I don't have to make up. That was a period of life, had a, its own purpose, mm-hmm. and you don't have to go back and redo it. Well, that is a great lesson to learn. Mm -hmm. I think we're all in the process Mm -hmm. of learning those lessons. (laughs) Um, So let's make it a little easier. What do you think your greatest accomplishment has been? Mm. Maybe that's not (laughs) as easy. (laughs) Asking these deep philosophical Mm. questions. I think, you know, going from kind of basically having nothing to do with music and not being able to contribute at all, my greatest accomplishment has been one to be resurrected in this career and then to be able to pour it back out to others i think despite the fact that i wouldn't wish that on anybody you know it did like as you said it gave me the opportunity to help others later that i didn't realize when i was younger so Mm -hmm. that i think is a a great opportunity well and you persevered Mm -hmm. again yes (laughs) yeah that must have been i can't even imagine Mm -hmm. how spending six years of thinking in your 20s like you said the supposed to be the the best years (laughs) and and thinking i don't know that i can do this Mm -hmm. if this is even a feasible path for me Mm -hmm. so to to rise out of that Mm -hmm. and then be able to share the story is is amazing yeah yeah definitely Um, and i you know i really appreciate you know i i'm sure most pianists you talk to will Mm -hmm. say oh yeah i went through a period where i would you know, had some injuries or I wasn't able to practice or, you know, whatever level that is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, being able to say, well, you can get through it. You you just, again, perseverance and Mm -hmm. then being able to pass along that, the, the, the information Mm -hmm. to, to get through it. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, you're such a role model that people can say, ah, well, look, here's somebody (laughs) who's so successful and look what she's been through and here she is Mm -hmm. and that's wonderful right Mm -hmm. yeah okay now your final question okay again is you might have to dig a little deep (laughs) but yeah as you know this is the piano inspires podcast Mm -hmm. and so how does piano inspire you or Mm -hmm. how does piano inspire the world your community fill in the blank okay well i think piano inspires one because we have 88 keys <laughs> we can play multiple mm-hmm. harmonies and melodies we can be all of the things right musically and so i do think our instrument is the best um but i think piano inspires because you can take it to so many places so many people understand it it's so accessible there's so many instruments i believe they just don't have that same accessibility Mm-hmm. And so people immediately know what piano is. They know, like, they all think they can play it, right? <laughs> and so we have such a great opportunity, right, to not only be teachers, but to be educators through performing, whether you play in a church or a big concert stage or in your local community, in your school. And I just think, you know, who has that ability to be in so many spaces and to share music in that way? Just the piano. Right. We're pretty special that way. I think that we're awesome. So if we fast forward 10 years and we're looking at 
the the world through music mm -hmm. what is your what is your hope what is your vision of how music is going to touch the future well i hope the box gets bigger and that we realize that you know there's so many people that want music and it's not just one type of audience that sort of needs it and that the more people that we can reach that's a benefit for us and them and so i think whatever your gift is in music whatever you enjoy doing expand your box so that you can reach the people that you're supposed to reach and even beyond that people you don't even think that would be interested often are more curious than you think we will expand the box yes. we'll just let's break the box break oh break absolutely box <laughs> get rid of the box mm -hmm. yes we, we're gonna get rid of the box mm -hmm. and bring music to everybody yes i love that sounds great well i think that's a great place to end okay thank you andy this thank has been great so i really appreciate it yeah. The Francis Clark Center is a not-for-profit educational organization that serves the advancement of piano teaching, learning, and performing. Divisions include Piano Magazine, Piano Inspires Kids, Journal for Piano Research, National Conference on Keyboard Pedagogy, The New School for Music Study, Piano Education Press, International Online Teacher Education, and Piano Inspires Online Community Hub. Please visit us at pianoinspires.com to learn more about our impactful work and inspiring community.